All right, guys, we're in Romans chapter 6, and what we're going to do, for those of you watching at home, I'm sorry this is coming to you a little late, but we're skipping the internet, we're just recording this, and then we'll upload it later on. Romans chapter 6, and uh, we're going to jump right in at verse 1, but let me point out a couple of things about the chapter as a whole that will set the stage for us, hopefully help us understand it properly. Um, I think if I could give one title to this chapter, I, I would call it Applying the Gospel, the, the Application of the Gospel. So you understand we're saved by believing the gospel, but then we are also supposed to live according to the gospel. So the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ should be a part of our daily life. We should live out that, that gospel, work out our salvation, so to speak. Uh, and this chapter, I think, goes a long way towards uh, illustrating and explaining that. So I really don't have an outline for the chapter. It's, it's pretty much that thought of applying the gospel. And then this, this sub-point to that, once you have applied the gospel, you're going to have these two statements. Because I am, and then fill in that blank, I will do, and then fill in that blank. And throughout this chapter, Paul's going to go back and forth and talk about what we are and a doctrinal truth about us. Because we are saved, we're in Christ, we have believed the gospel, then this is a fact. But because of this fact, this is what we should do. So I've also pointed out in the chapter, um, actual, I didn't write verbs. <laughs> Let's put verbs here with it. Being verbs and action verbs. Right? I'm not getting into a linguistic lesson here, but a being verb is is, are, am, shall be, were. Those, type, those kind of verbs you're going to see throughout the chapter. But then I've listed out, I went through and perhaps I missed one or two, but I tried to find every action verb in the chapter. Right, so even starting off with the question, continue, live, should, walk, and, and you can write the list down later on. But these are the things, because I am saved, right? because I am crucified with Christ, I am buried with Christ, I am risen with Christ. Because of that, then I should be doing all of this, and in some cases, not doing certain things. All right, something else you need to really pay attention to in this chapter. This um, topic is going to loom large. Standing versus state. All right, so the being verbs are going to give us our standing. It is what you are. But then the state, this is the, the quality of your condition, your, your temporary condition. And this one is based on what you do, right? If you're obedient, if you yield, if you don't serve sin and so forth, then it is going to, it's not going to change your standing. You're, you're crucified, buried, risen with Christ. That's finished and clawed. Nothing can change that. But now that you are a child of God, if you do these things, it improves the state of your childhood, if I can say it like that, or your sonship, perhaps, is a better word to use there. All right, so I, I think we've covered standing versus state. I, I think you're aware of that, that, that dichotomy in the Bible, that those two things exist. This chapter does a lot to explain that as well. So Romans 6 and verse 1. What shall we say then? Right, so let's, we've got to back up and just refresh our memories as to what he's talking about. In verses, chapter 5, verse 20 and 21, the law entered that the offense might abound. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Right, so you have the, the, the system of works, you have the system of grace. Under the system of works, right, there's the law, and then because of our sinful nature, we break the law, and now we're kind of slaves in that system where the strength of sin is the law. We're constantly rebelling and, and going against the law, and it just keeps us tripping over our own feet all the time. But then grace came in and rescued us from this horrible pit of sin. But now there's a perhaps a, a misconception, and Paul's aware of this. People could look at this and go, oh, so every time I sin, that triggers grace from God, right? Because if I sin, then God covers it by grace. So the more I sin, the more grace I get. Now, this was, Paul did this earlier in the book of Romans. Remember in chapter 3, Paul was talking about how God should be true, and, or God is true, and every man's a liar. And even when we lie, Paul points out, is that ringing? Oh, man. Boy, what in the world's going on tonight with the technology? Anyway, um, 
that even when we lie, eventually the truth comes out. Eventually God manifests that you were lying, he was right, you were wrong. So at the end of the day, God is going to get glory, right? So then Paul knew some of his enemies were saying, well, if that's the case, the more I lie, the more opportunities God has to prove himself right and me wrong. So then lying actually isn't wrong because it eventually glorifies God. And that's why you got to be careful about making the glory of God the ultimate goal. Glorifying God is not the ultimate goal of us being here. Now, believe me, we are supposed to glorify Him, but there's a certain way He wants that glory. God's going to get glory whether you give it or not. Just because of who He is, He's going to get glory. But the, the way He wants that glory is for you to willingly submit to His way and not your way. That's the best way to give Him glory, not, not to force it out of you or to manipulate you into doing something, right? So that's perhaps another subject. But So the same idea of somebody taking a truth and twisting it, Paul's, again, he realizes somebody might take the system of grace and abuse it. So now that we have grace, shall, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So... Somebody might say, well, Paul, if I heard you right, every time I sin, God sends more grace. So wouldn't it be a good idea to continue in sin? And verse 2, God forbid. Of course not. That's, that's not why God sent down his grace. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, do you notice in verse 2, I'm just going to do this once or twice as we get going, and then I, all of this is going to kind of, it'll kick in. You'll see how it's working. But do you see it in verse 2? How shall we that are dead to sin? There's your being verb, are dead. How, how shall we live any longer therein? So there's your action verb. So because this is true, I'm dead to sin, then this is the proper action that should be taken or, or not taken in this case. All right, so how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Let me ask you a question. Um, on what day will you stop sinning never to sin again? Almost. True, true, but that's, there's another answer as well. That when you die, when you die, right? Now, for some of us, right, some of you will die. Some of us maybe even will die. I'm a little closer than a lot of you. <laughs> and, and, and then there's some of us that won't die, right? We which are alive and remain shall be caught up. So you have those two options. So let's... let's give one answer that covers them both. When the flesh vanishes away, right? When the flesh is destroyed, that's also another way to say it. Because whether you're talking death or rapture, the flesh is no longer viable. So I know it's kind of morbid, right? I, I, I don't like talking about our mortality, but the older I get, the more it's sinking in. I'm not going to be here much longer. And, and you know, part of that brings a bit of sadness. But there's also a joy involved. If you're a Christian, to die is gain. And one thing you gain is a sinless perfection. I'm never going to sin again. So there are reasons I want to keep kicking and, you know, keep going. But there's also a pretty good reason when Paul, Paul says in Philippians 1, for to me to depart and be with Christ is far better. It's far better. Why? For me personally, far better. Now, if I'm not thinking about anything else, not my family, not my ministry, not you, just for me, oh man, let me out of this body. <laughs> Please let me out of this body. There's no reason, there's nothing about my physical life that wants to stay on this earth. Everything that wants to keep me here is you. It's outside of me. It's my family, it's my church, it's, it's lost people that could get saved. If it's just left to me, I've had enough. <laughs> I've, 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 I've seen what the world has to offer. I'm not interested. Let's just get on up to glory and get over with, get it over with. All right, now, the reason I point this out is, is the sweetness of death is you stop sinning. Okay, but you are dead. But you are dead. So that, that truth, now that's a spiritual truth, right? That's not a physical truth. It's a spiritual truth. You were crucified and buried with Christ. You are dead. So now apply that truth on a daily basis and say, I, I'm dead. I'm seated at the right hand of God. So my affections are up there, not down here. Just imagine for a moment, right? I mean, the Apostle Paul had this happen. Just imagine dying and taking a trip up to heaven. 
and just let your mind wander for a moment down the hallways of heaven. I mean, just breathe it in. T take in a, a nice, inhale deeply. And, and, and just peek around and look at the angels. Just listen closely. You hear them singing and, and just check out the 24 elders. If you see who they are, please let me know. And they're casting their crowns and everybody's praising the Lord. And you see some loved ones that have gone before. And oh my goodness, what a wonderful scene. Okay, and, and now you've had your moment, right? You're in this state where you know no matter what I think, say, or do, it's going to be right. I don't have to worry about sin at all. This is going to be perfect from here on out. Never again will I make a mistake that disappoints the one seated on the throne. Okay, now that's, that's the best situation because if your chief aim in life is to fear the Lord, know the Lord, please the Lord, walk with the Lord, then the best you can do is die. <laughs> and because that's where you will achieve that, right? Now just think for a moment if that were to happen and you had a few, let's say, hours, even days up in glory, and then you came back down. How do you think it would affect your, your everyday life? It would probably change a few priorities, right? It would make sin a lot less appealing. It would make ministry opportunities, prayer, reading about the, reading the Bible. Oh, man, that would be a fresh perspective. You read Revelation and go, no, I was there. <laughs> yeah, I know what that looks like. I was there. I would let you teach the class for sure. <laughs> but imagine how that would change your life, having just a few moments on the other side of the grave. But now, if you believe the Bible, you've already been on the other side of the grave. Here's why I say this. Imagine now, I'm taking you on a thought journey here, but you got Jesus on the cross. And then he looks down at you and he says, come here, you're with me now. Right? So, I mean, you got to play this through. You got to have an imagination for this. But it says, look at verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is what? Crucified. What are the next two words? With him. All right? You know what? Mark chapter 3, verse 14 says, when Jesus called his 12 apostles, that they should be with him. This is discipleship. This is what it's all about. He says, all right, you, you've accepted me now. Here, I want you to come, come up here with me. He's hanging up there on the cross. He said, now, you, come on, you're going to die with me. And, you, and, and you're there with him. And then he says, okay, now we've died. Now, verse 3, know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. We're going to come back to that in a moment. Therefore, we are buried, what are the next two words? With, with him. So, so go through this with him. So, okay, there I am. There, my old man crucified. And, and my old man buried. And then verse 4, buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So verse 5 talks about the likeness of his resurrection. So now, taking this truth, God said that you are with him. Crucified, buried, Colossians 2 says you're risen with him. So now saying, God, I didn't feel it happen. But we don't, we don't walk by feelings. We walk by faith. And God said, yes, but you're in, my son. you're in my son. So if it happened to him, it happened to you. So now I apply that and go, okay, then I've... Then I've gone through death, I'm seated at the right hand of God, and now I'm going to walk with a new life. That's going to change the way I look at everything. So that's as practical as I know how to make this chapter. And that's really the heart, I think, of the entire chapter. So verse number three, we'll go back and get a few extra things here. Know ye not that so many of us, as we're baptized into water, were baptized into his death. Did I read it correctly? All right, I'm glad you're following along. Verse 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ. That is a spiritual baptism. It has to be. There's no water there. This is something you get in discipleship, but we, we try to emphasize there that don't, you don't make the mistake of reading the word baptism and thinking baptism equals water. That's not, that's, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. You always let the context tell you what kind of baptism. Baptism is immersion. It is dipping. It is taking one thing, putting it into another thing. So you were placed into Jesus Christ. So when that happened, you were baptized into his death. Paul said, don't you know this? 
Notice that phrase, though, verse 3, know ye not, verse 6, knowing this, verse 9, knowing that, verse 16, know ye not. You'll see Paul uses that quite a bit. He's saying, guys, don't, don't you know this? Don't you know this? You know there are a lot of things that you should just know from a, a simple read of the Bible. But, but how many times are Christians, and Paul says this on many occasions, brethren, I would not that you would be ignorant. And just a simple read of the Bible would clue you in to go, wait a minute. Yeah, that's true. I do know this. I know that I am. And once you know that, it's going to make, this part's going to fall into place naturally. Well, if I am this, then I must do that. Right? So verse uh, 3, you have been baptized into his death. All right? So with that fact in mind, he brings out this practical thought. Verse 4, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, what's the next word? Should. Now you see, it's not a guarantee, but you should. Because this is true, I'm buried and risen, because of that, I should walk. It says we also should walk in newness of life. So just as Christ came out of the grave, came out of the tomb. He has that glorified, resurrected body. Now, he's able to still move and mingle amongst the disciples, right, and function, but he is no longer limited by the same, um, let's say he no longer had the same limitations as he did before he died. Even, now this is hard to say, but but Jesus' situation improved. I don't want to say he improved, right, because he was human, a sinless human, and that's as good as it could have been, but, but his situation got better after his resurrection. Now he's able to move up to heaven and back down within like two hours. He can walk through walls. He can eat without getting fat. I mean, all of that stuff. <laughs> Life was good. But, but we also, now, just because you're saved, I don't want you to think that you can eat and not get fat. Right? I just made that connection in my head. You, you, you're walking in newness of life. So things should be different and obviously much better. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So verse 5 is a guaranteed thing. I I hope you can see and appreciate the eternal security in verse 5. If you have been planted together in his death, so you're crucified with him, been saved, then that that is a guarantee you're going to come up in the resurrection just like he did. You're going to come up with a glorified body. The one leads to the other. That that is not conditioned. That's not a state thing. That's not an action verb. This is a being thing. Because of this, this will this will also be. In verse six, knowing this. Now, notice at the end of verse five, there's no full stop. So verse five is one of these being statements. This is a standing thing. Planted together, so you've been saved. Now you're dead with him, buried with him. This means your future is guaranteed. You're going to be resurrected. Now, based on all of that, what do we do? Verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be, be, there's another being verb, might be destroyed. Now, that word destroyed, in other places, it's translated as vanish away. See, so whether we're talking about death, literally destroying the body, or the rapture, where the body literally vanishes away. Either way, the verse is true. Why, why did we get saved? So that eventually we could put off this body of sin. Because this is always going to weigh us down. That the body of sin might be destroyed. That, henceforth, we, here comes the action, should not serve sin. So certain things are guaranteed. The body of sin might be destroyed. That is, that is going to happen. That's a being thing. But then, what do we do with all that, all those promises we should not serve sin? It makes no sense to keep serving sin because what has it done for us? Sin's going to give you a temporary pleasure in this life, right? The Bible says that in Hebrews chapter 11. There's pleasure in sin for a season. But, but we, we as believers, we know the whole scope of this. We're crucified with Him, past tense, saved. Now, one day we're going to be in the likeness of his resurrection. This body's not going to be here forever. What's the point in making it happy? It's not going to be here very long. I am going to be with God forever. 
in a resurrected body. So let's lay up treasure to that. Let's get ready for that day. Verse 7, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now there's your standing. That's, that's your being verbs. This is because you're dead, you're freed from sin. Now, the application of that, right? This is where somebody might read this and think, okay, well, if I'm freed from sin, sin has no power on me. I can't be tempted. Oh, you're freed from sin, yes, in that you're, you're dead with Christ on the cross, but that outward man, that living this, out, uh, this, uh, living this practical life every day, that, that can be another story. He that is dead is freed from sin. Now, he's going to do some reasoning. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Right? There's that past to the future tense. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. So now that Jesus has died, he rises back up. That's it. Death has no, there's nothing, there's no way he could ever die again. He's already paid for all the sins of mankind. There's no more sins left to pay for. Well, that's, ha that's what happened to Christ. This is a brilliant passage on eternal security. That because of that happened to Christ, this is not because I'm in him, death no longer has any dominion over me either. So even though I might die, that's not the end of me. Ultimately, Christ has dominion over me, and he's going to change this body and raise it up. So verse 10, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. As he comes out of the grave and has this glorified body, he no longer has to deal with temptations of sin and mankind. He's going to just go sit at the right hand of God. That's also our plan. Now that you're saved, you have one objective, live unto God. I have one purpose for God doing all this for me, just to live for him. Verse number 11, watch the being verb come into this. Likewise, reckon. So do you see that word likewise? That means we have to take verse 7, 8, 9, 10, learn that, that uh, doctrinal truth, that standing statement there. Okay, so he died unto sin, he lives unto God. That's how it works. Now, if that's how it works, then reckon that to be so in your lives. Take that same truth and apply it. Apply the gospel. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I've illustrated it like this a few times. Um, when I, I don't know why. This always comes up when I'm talking to people that struggle with like an addiction. But uh, I think it's applicable for everyone. Imagine yourself sitting in a prison cell. Right? You are a prisoner. You're a captive. And then somebody comes along and opens the prison door, the, the gate to your cell, and says you're free. And then you look at it and you go, oh, wow. That's great, but you just sit there. You don't leave. You just sit there. Are you free? Yes, but no. Because <laughs> you're still in the prison cell. You're not, you're not doing what a free man should do. Are you free? Are you free? Yes, the door is open. But are you acting like a free man? No. See, do you see how that, that truth can be split? Depends on what, how you're talking about it. So the same thing for us. We should reckon that the fact that the gate's open, now get up and get out of that prison and go do something about this wonderful freedom you have in Christ. All right, verse 11, Reckon all, ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, so every day you're going to have to renew the inward man. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4 just quickly. Every day you're going to have to reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God. It's almost like reminding yourself that this is the case. Because the world, the flesh, and the devil will constantly try to make you think everything that is, you can see it, feel it, taste it, touch it, smell it. It's all right here, the, the senses. And, and like Dr. Rutten used to say, you get up and go, there you are, there's my enemy right there. And you look at his, you look at his flesh, you, there you are, I can see you. And then... <laughs> It kind of makes us sound a little insane, to be honest, but, well, who isn't crazy these days? But you almost have, you have a conversation. You have a conversation with yourself. And, and, and you read the Bible. You say, okay, I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. All right, you're dead. Mike, you're dead. And you know what Mike says to Mike? Mike looks in the mirror and says, you don't look dead. 
because you're talking <laughs> and you're about to go get something to eat and then you got other things to do. You're not acting like a dead man, but you're dead. Where'd you get that? God said, I'm dead. Do you feel dead? I don't care how I feel. God said, I'm dead. And this is where your faith has to be bigger than your feelings. And you have to live according to that faith. God said, where does faith come from? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God said, I'm dead, so I'm going to act like I'm dead. Dead to sin and alive unto God, right? Dead to sin and alive unto God. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16. He says, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed, how often? Day by day. Every day. This is where this draws into the, into the uh, conversation, Luke chapter 9, verse 23. If any man will come after me, let him take up his cross and follow, uh, deny himself daily, or take up his cross daily, deny himself and follow me. Every day, you're going to have to do that. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, I die daily. And this is what he meant. He, he wasn't talking about getting saved every day. Every day he reckoned himself dead indeed unto sin. All right, back to Romans 6 and verse 12. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Do you see the action to this? This is what we should do or, and not do. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Now, how can this be though? If I'm dead, I'm freed from sin, then how is it sin could possibly reign over me if you choose to let it? If you choose to let it. So going back to my illustration, the guy in the prison cell, the door's open. I mean, you could get up and shut the door again. I mean, if you want to be a ding dong about this, you could make life a whole lot more difficult on yourself and say, well, I'll just stay in my sin and continue to live in my sinful cell. Well, now the owner of the prison said, you're free, right? So your freedom is there. You can shut the door all you want. That's how you live, right? That door is how you live. You're free. You can go if you want. But it's your choice to get up and go out of the cell. The, the owner of the prison granted you freedom, so you ought to use that. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lusts thereof. Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So I'm, I'm going to fall back to what I gave you earlier. If you took that trip to heaven and you came back, then obviously you know, wow, okay, I've seen the other side. I know it's there. This is so worth it. All of my devotion and commitment, Lord, here I am, right? The next step to this is Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It just makes sense after all he's done. God, here I am. That, that is yielding your members as instruments of righteousness. Whatever you can do with me, God, here I am. I'm all, all yours. The word yield is an interesting word. Um, it actually means to give up power. I mean, at its, at its root meaning, that's what it is. It's, it's, I have my rights. I could do something, but I will not exercise them. I will yield. I will submit them to someone else. I often think of traffic when I think of yielding. Um, not that everybody pays attention to that yield sign, but you know, when you see the yield sign, if someone else is already moving, you hang back and you let them go. You let them have the right of way. You're giving up your rights. So can you use your body for sin? Can you use it to fulfill your life? Yes, but you have to willingly say, no, no, I, I could do that, but I shouldn't. So I'm going to reckon myself dead and say, God, here, I, I, there's, I have no use for sin anymore. You use it. And now I'm yielding my rights to him. Verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Now that's, uh, that we're back to the being type of, of verb, to the standing statement. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. That ye are not, the being verb. You're not under the law, but under grace. Now immediately, you give somebody this, right? What does it mean to be under the law? Sin, get punished. Sin, get punished. What is it under grace? Sin, no punishment. Sin, no punishment. Punishment given to Christ. So immediately, our sinful nature hears that and goes, ooh. 
I don't have to pay the bill? Okay, <laughs> right? That's just how sin works. So verse 15, what then? Shall we sin? He knew. He knew we would think that. So he immediately answers it. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. No, of course not. We're not supposed to abuse this and just run up the bill. That's not the right response. Verse 16, he's going to explain this further. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. So every day you have that choice. And in the temporary, we're talking state now, in the moment when you choose to serve sin, then in that moment, sin is your master for that moment. Now, ultimately, Jesus has set you free from that. So this is utter nonsense that you're yielding to your old master who's, who did nothing but abuse you, used you, mistreated you, ruined your life. Now you're going back to that. It's, you know, it's a, it's a sad story when this happens, but you'll find it sometimes with a, a woman who's in a bad relationship with a man or, you know, a bad marriage. And the man's abusive, and then finally she gets away from him. It's heartbreaking to hear sometimes where the woman goes back to the man. He says, well, you know, everybody makes mistakes. I'll just give him another. That old man is sin, and he's not going to change. He's not going to get any better. Your best options stay far away, but you have that choice. And if you yield this way to sin, then for that moment, he's reigning over you. And if you obviously go towards God and righteousness and obedience, then you're allowing him to sit upon the throne of your heart. Now, we know that we have this choice. Back in verse 12, he said, let not therefore sin reign in your mortal body. If Paul commands us to not let that happen, it means it can happen. You do have that choice. The reason I'm, I'm emphasizing that is because some people will say, and this comes out in various levels, but people will say, now that you're saved, you will not live in sin, or you will not continue to do certain things. That's a choice you have to make. You have the power and the freedom to not serve sin anymore. Whereas before you got saved, you had no other master dwelling inside of you. You were locked up in that cage of sin, and there was nowhere else to go. You had no choice. You were just depraved and in the dark, and that was it. Now you have that choice. But it would be wrong to think, now that I've had this salvation experience, therefore I am definitely not going to serve sin. You definitely have a chance, a fighting chance, but you're going to have to carry that cross and not deny yourself daily. Verse 17, but God be thanked that you were, there's a bean verb, that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Right, the form of doctrine... Uh, you can perhaps think of this in two ways, the faith or the gospel. And to be honest, I think those two go together in this case. The faith of the gospel is probably a good way to say it. But somebody showed up to these Romans and explained to them what it means to be saved and, and how to get saved. That's the form of doctrine. So it's not just uh, the gospel. It's not just the death, burial, and resurrection, but it's everything that goes with that. Now that you are saved, all of these things are possible and so forth. So he says, God be thanked, you were the servants of sin. That was your, your standing. You were a slave to that, you had no choice. But you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine. Now what does it mean to obey from the heart? Uh, look at Romans 10, verse 16. Romans 10 and verse 16. It says here, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. How do you obey the gospel? For Isaiah saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. So what does the gospel demand from us? What action is it demanding that we take? Belief. Trust this, that this will work. So that's what these Romans did. When, when the truth was delivered to them about what Jesus can do, what, what his death, burial, and resurrection offers us, they believed that. And when they did, come back to Romans 6, verse 18, this is the result of it. Being, being then made free from sin, ye became, there's a being verb, ye became the servants of righteousness. So as a standing statement, right? You are a servant of righteousness, not a servant of sin. That, that's how God looks at the situation. Now, from God looking down on us, that's the truth. 
But now me looking up, I have to look at that truth and say, okay, I'm going to apply that. So verse number 19, he gives us a very good illustration for this. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. So he says, I'm going to use a very human illustration. And, and it's a bit dodgy, to be honest, what he's going to make us think about here for a second. And that's why he says, because of the infirmity of your flesh. He says, I know how sinful you are. I know how depraved you are. So I'm going to say something right down on your level, <laughs> something that you can all get and process. And you, you'll see it now. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto holiness. Now let me point something out, and then we'll talk about the, the point he's making. Notice in the middle there, as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity. What does iniquity lead to? Unto iniquity. Do you see that? Sin just leads to more sin. Sin is like salt water. Right? You, 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 take a, you get a drink because you're thirsty. You're out there stranded in the ocean. You get a drink because you're desperate. But as soon as you get that salt water, it just makes you more thirsty. And that's how sin is. Sin makes you think, if I could just have this one pleasure, then as soon as you get it, you go, oh, i got to have that again. And then it just leads to more and more sin. All right, now with that thought in mind, the, the overall point he's making here, he says, now think back to when you were lost. That's, that's the dodgy part. We don't want to do that very often. But he says, think back to when you were lost, how much effort did you put into sin? How much time and effort and resources, how hard did you party? How, to what lengths did you go to impress people and make friends? How many times did you cheat in business to make money? I mean, just think of all the awful, sinful, horrible things you did. I don't think it's healthy to get into long explanations of how bad I was, but it was not uncommon to stay up through the night just hanging out with friends, doing one thing after another that should never be done nor repeated. That wasn't uncommon. Now, how many times have I spent the night with God? I said, God, here I am. Whatever you need me for tonight, we can pray. We can go out preaching. We can witness. I can, I can be with my family. I can just do something right and I'll put my very best effort into it, right? I'll get my friends together, and we'll enjoy this together. I mean, the, the illustration is it's kind of a strange one. That's why he says, because of the infirmity of your flesh, you'll be able to understand this. But the same effort you put into sin, how much more effort now should we put into righteousness that leads to holiness? All right, so verse 20. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. You see the being verbs, back to a standing statement. You were the servants of sin. All right, so back when you were lost, what did you have to do with righteousness? What was your connection to righteousness? None. I didn't have the righteousness of God. I had, I had no thirst for righteousness. I didn't hunger and thirst after that. I wasn't concerned about doing right. I was concerned about getting what I want. That was my concern. So I was free from righteousness in every single way. Verse 21, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? So after telling us, you know, think back to your lost life and how much, he said, now, now you're ashamed of that, aren't you? Which is a nice dose of reality for the illustration that he used. So now all that stuff that you enjoyed and, and this, all that effort you put into sin, what do you have to show for it? What did it get you? Did, did, it make, did it help you, truly help you, in any viable, long-term, eternal, spiritual way? No. What was the outcome of it? Heartbreak, loss of friendships, regret, pain, anxiety, bills, health problems. I mean, nothing good comes of that. What fruit had you then in those things where you're now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. All right, now think for a moment. What is death? What is death? And I'm not trying to get all philosophical on you here, but I am going to challenge your thinking on this a little bit because most people think death means you stop breathing. And that's true, but that is a very, can I say, shallow version of death. There's a much bigger version of death, right? Death is the absence of life. So, so where did life originate from? Who is the giver of life, the source of all life? God. We're the offspring of God. He's Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Right? So God is life. He is true life, eternal life. 
to be separated from God, you are separated from life. So what do you have? Death. So death is when you are not connected or joined to the Lord. You have no source of life. You have a godless life. You're without God and without hope. That's how Ephesians chapter 2 puts it. That is a horrifying existence. To think I'm walking around, but I'm dead. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, She that liveth in pleasure is dead while she yet lives. Why? Because she's not walking with God. So the end of those things is death. Where did that get me? It got me as far away from God as I possibly could be. Now, yes, sure, it will lead to the grave eventually. But that's one small aspect of death. The bigger, more horrifying aspect of death is the second death where you are eternally separated from God with no way back to Him. I said verse 22, But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, that's the doctrinal truth of it, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Now, we've recently talked about everlasting or eternal life in Galatians 6. Remember that? If you sow to the Spirit, you of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So again, using what I just said about death, it's the absence of a relationship with God. What is everlasting life? It is the presence of a relationship with God. It is being connected to true life. Now that I am connected to Him, the fruit of that, the fruit of being saved and being a servant to God, it leads to a, a clean life. It leads to a godly life, a, God, a life that resembles the nature and characteristics of God. And the end, when he says the end, he's not saying you have to wait till you die and then you get everlasting life after that. He said the end goal of serving God is to build the relationship with Him, to make it closer and, and to enjoy it more. Uh, we got just a second. Turn to uh, Jeremiah chapter 9. The reason I want to bear fruit and live a holy life is so that my walk with God can be sweeter, more and more meaningful. Jeremiah 9, verse 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So this, th these two verses go a long way to explaining life, I think. So, so many people are stuck in verse 23. They're trying to define themselves with those things. Education, power, money. But, but what life is all about is in verse 24. Understanding and knowing God. And, and that he is a certain kind of God, which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. All right, so coming back to Romans chapter 6, once you've been set free from sin and now you're a servant to God, you're interested in living a life that uh, matches his nature so that you can walk in agreement with him. Verse 23, a verse you all know, I'm sure, and have memorized even, for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, strangely enough, we quote that a lot. Rightfully so. It's a great verse. But I fear that we don't appreciate just how rich that verse is. The wages of sin is death. That's not just the grave. Right? That's what I've tried to point out. The wages of sin is death. The moment Adam sinned, what happened? It affected his relationship with God. What happened in Genesis 3? He tries to cover it up. And stay in the presence of God. Won't work. God said, you got to get out. You're no longer allowed in my presence. Death, right? He said, the day you eat thereof, you'll surely die. The wages of sin is death. The moment you willingly choose to sin, you start to pay the price. And death sets in. Spiritual death, separated from God. The wages of sin is death. Now, what happens if a person, when they sin, right? They're separated from God. But the further you go into sin, the further away you get. From, from God, from His presence and knowing Him personally. All right, so the wages of sin is death, and that's one extreme. 
But then the other extreme is this. The gift of God is eternal life. Now, the gift of God, that's something that is given to you by grace. You don't earn that. And that ties in Romans chapter 3, 4, 5, and Paul's been explaining how we're justified by faith and all of that, and it's a, a gracious gift given to us. The gift of God is eternal life. Now, what we often say about this verse, the wages of sin is going to the grave, but the gift of God is going to heaven. Right? And that's limiting the verse. Yes, those things are true, but that's, that's not all that we're talking about. The gift of God is Him saying, okay, there's nothing you've done to deserve this, but I'd like to have a relationship with you. And here, I've done everything necessary to make that possible. I want you to be with me. So I, all the way down to my hardest moments, crucified, buried, and then this glorious moment resurrected, I want you to be a part of me. Be with me. That's what He's offering any sinner. The gift of God is eternal life. But the only way that's possible is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So whenever I'm on the streets or illustrating that to somebody, I've used this several times. I'll, I'll tell them, do you want eternal life? Yes. Okay, this is eternal life. Now, eternal life is it's through Jesus Christ. So if you want to have eternal life, the book, th this is Jesus, eternal life. If I can find that. <laughs> it's hidden in there. Eternal life is in there. It's in there. So you can't have eternal life without Jesus Christ. So the one is through the other. And I mean, it's just a nice, simple way of getting, you know, a visual to help them see I, I can't have one without the other. All right, that brings us to the end of chapter 6. I love that chapter. Great. It, it's actually a simple chapter, right? Because it's just, this is what we are, so do this. But, man, it, it really reminds you of how awesome it is to be saved and what's possible as a saved person, what you can actually achieve. Okay, any questions about any of this? Yes, ma'am. Yes. It, it does. Well, it, I, I think you have to read this um, thinking about Paul writing to his saved audience. So he's, he's making a, an overall statement. You guys are free from sin, and you've you're made uh, you've become servants to God. That's a historical fact for them a doctrinal and historical fact. It's also a historical fact that because they had been saved and had been serving God, that now they have fruit unto holiness and they are building up their relationship with God. So I, I think he's saying this based on how the Romans had been applying the gospel. He says, you guys have evidence for what I'm saying. You've seen this in your own lives. Now, of course, that's true for us as well. As we obey, then the fruit comes and leads to that holy life. Yes, sir. Um, in verse 14 where it says, sin shall not have dominion over you, mm -hmm. for you are not under the law, but under grace. Um, the, I understand signing the state and all of that, but mm -hmm. when it says have dominion over you, could, could the case not be made to say that um, there is a, a Christian will not live in such a state to have complete, completely, uh, when it says sin has complete dominion over Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Good. Understanding the other things like let not that rain, mm -hmm. but here it says it shall not have dominion. It's a definitive. It it is, but based on the last part of the verse, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So, it, it, if he were to say sin shall not have dominion over you, for and then list some one of these for you do this or that, then I think it would tie into what you're saying. Now, the idea, though, the concept of uh, can a saved person live in habitual sin? Because that's, am I kind of framing your question in another way there? No, right. Without repentance. Right. It's just a so they, they are actually pursuing sin as a saved person the same way they did as a lost person. Yeah. And I, I think that hypothetically that is possible. Um, the problem with this, with this hypothetical case is because as soon as, you, as soon as you discuss that, and here's a person who is chasing after sin like they did when they were lost, then we are automatically going to stand back and go, I don't know if that person's actually saved. Because if they are, why would they be doing that? So it's going to raise that question mark. 
but I don't think we can definitively say, well, they're living purposely and enjoying this wicked life, therefore that proves dogmatically they're, they're lost. There are examples in the Bible of people choosing the wrong, and I, I think maybe there's a bit of a, I won't say a gray area, but what qualifies as dominion, right? And how long does a person have to commit that sin for it to be called habitual? And how hard do they have to chase after it? And see, that it's kind of hard to qualify and quantify that. So I, I think it, theoretically it's possible for a saved person to do any sin that a lost person can do. I mean, there's consequences to that, but I think verse 14 is limited to the, to the standing and to the being statements because of the end of the verse. So sin is not ultimately going to have dominion over you. It can't because you're not under the law. And the strength of sin is the law. So now that you're not under the law, sin can't have dominion in that way. Now we need to apply that truth and say, since sin cannot have dominion over me, it makes no sense. Sin cannot come in and just dominate. I have to yield to it. So it makes no sense for me to go and yield to something that actually has no power. That, I think that's the, kind of the contradiction he's trying to show them. So. All right. That's the best I can do with that. Yes, sir. Raised him from the grave, from the dead. Well, that that we could actually get into a, a long explanation on that. Um, the Father raised him. He raised himself, and the Spirit raised him. All three members of the Trinity. We read in Scripture that all of them are responsible to some extent for raising him from the dead. Um, I'm, I'm trying to tie to tie this together with your question. When he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He's quoting Psalm 22, right? So there's, we could dig into that for a little bit. But yes, there's, I, I do believe there was a separation. I, that's probably the moment that Jesus became sin, if I had to guess, and I am guessing there. Um, but only a few minutes later, maybe even, I don't know, half an hour later or something, Jesus says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. So the relationship had been reestablished already by that point. So at no time did some some people have said that that God ceased to be Jesus's father. And that's why he said my God, my God instead of my father, my father. But I I think that's stretching and then that's that's taking a bit too much from the context. I, I think he cried that because there was a separation but then that he was still the son of the father the whole time. I do think so. Well, uh, yeah, scripturally, that's for sure, yes. Yeah, the Father, the Son raised himself and, and the Spirit. All right, anything else? All good? Okay, let's have a word of prayer and we'll head to the house. Amen. Vion, can you please close us in prayer?